I'm so excited about this conversation that I had with Susan Nyman. She is an American philosopher and writer. She has written extensively on the Enlightenment, moral philosophy, metaphysics and politics. And she has a new book, Left is Not Woke, which came out in this year, 2023. And it is essentially exploring the intellectual roots of wokeness and why a movement, i.e. wokeness, purporting to be on the left, purporting to be about social justice, is actually really the undoing of many traditional left ideals, whether that is um, the Enlightenment ideas of universalism, of, of freedom, of human agency. And she is really challenging this. So I think this is really exciting. Oftentimes, when we talk about uh, wokeness and critiques of wokeness, unfortunately, it's often associated with people on the right. But actually, there's many thinkers uh, on the left, uh, whether that is Susan Nyman, also Yasha Monk, Thomas Chatterton Williams, and so on and so forth, that actually take a left wing view in their critique of wokeness. So I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Uh, make sure that you uh, leave comments and your feedbacks and your thoughts. I read as much as I can and uh, hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much, Susan, for joining me on the Equiano pod. I'm so looking forward to uh, having you discuss your thoughts, your new book. So that is, I'm going to get straight into it. So you've just recently uh, released a book, The Left Is Not Woke. Um, that's a very punchy, very interesting title. Could you just first give a little bit of an introduction about yourself and, and why you wrote this book and give us a, a quick rundown of it? A little introduction about myself is uh, is a bit complicated, but all, all one needs to know is uh, maybe I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, grew up in the middle of the civil rights movement that my mother was involved in. Our synagogue was bombed at the time. So the idea that um, Jews who are coded white and people of color um, stand by each other was one that I grew up with, um, which is, I suppose, one reason why what's been happening in the last 10 years or so on the so-called left has, um, has been so puzzling and frustrating and angering, I suppose, to me. I considered myself to be on the left uh, from the, you know, basically as soon, as soon as I was thinking politically consciously, I went on to study philosophy in uh, both at Harvard and at the Free University of Berlin, became a philosophy professor for a while, and for the last 23 years I have been running an independent uh, interdisciplinary think tank called the Einstein Forum just outside of Berlin. And I wrote this book because I was partly puzzled by things that were puzzling basically all my friends. I had a series of conversations with people where who would say at some point, you know, I think I'm not left anymore. Mm -hmm. And they would describe some woke excess. And I finally said to one of them, no, you've always been left. They're not left. And then I wanted to try and figure out what that meant because I really think the designation, the woke left or the far left or the hard left is completely wrong and the concept of woke um, is not a coherent one and that's what's so confusing because on the one hand it starts from emotions that uh, anybody on the left or the liberal left even have traditionally shared. So um, solidarity with people who are oppressed. Um, you, know, you want to stand on the side of people who are marginalized. You want to remember historical crimes and if possible um, do something about them or at, at least uh, remember them. And so all of those are traditionally left-wing emotions which I share and grew up having. And the problem is that those emotions are undercut by philosophical assumptions that people are often not conscious of at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have those assumptions even if you haven't read a word of philosophy because they've slipped into the mainstream. You, read, you pick them up every day uh, it, when you read the news. And I wanted to untangle that in order for people on the liberal left to be able to unite in ways that the right does perfectly well. 
And we are not noticing when we spend our time in battles about cultural appropriation or uh, pronouns. So your central argument is that many of the uh, ideas that have been come to be associated with the left, um, and particularly this idea of woke, uh, whether that's identity politics or hostility to freedom of speech, uh, things like that, are actually not really left wing and they are if not antithetical to a lot of the traditional um, ideals of what what was held up as the left. I mean, so what what I guess my first point would be, couldn't the left also encompass those things as well, that perhaps there's different, uh, different strategies or different uh, political strands within the left, and maybe woke is one of them. Because I remember in your book, you said that you're not willing to give up no. Well, you're not willing to cede um, the, the term left. So what, what do you say to those that this perhaps is just a strand of the left? I would say you're mistaken. And think about it, okay? Um, I don't like to use the word identity politics because it suggests that all of our identities, and everybody has a quite complicated identity, can be reduced to two, race and gender. And those are the two that we have the least control over. Okay, And in fact, one interesting exercise for people who want to think about this is just to sit down with a pencil and list uh, 10 identities that you feel are actually central to who you are. Uh, and there will turn out to be a lot of them, Okay, mother, daughter, uh, what your profession is, if it, what kind of music. Your nationality. Even? Your nationality. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Anthony Appiah, uh, philosopher, uh, who I um, think very highly of, wrote that the biggest difference that his parents had to negotiate was not that one was white and one was black, or that one was from England and the other was from Ghana, but that one was Anglican and the other was Methodist, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, it's incredibly reductionist to reduce our identities to these two. That's why I don't use the word identity politics. I prefer to use the word tribalism. Mm. This has upset a number of people. I've been told I was, you know, it would offend Native Americans. I said, you know, the concept of tribe goes back to the Bible. Mm. It's not the presence of Native Americans. And I got some pushback on this from people who then wound up quoting James Baldwin. Mm. Um, tweeting out a message of Baldwin saying, uh, you know, when is this tribalism going to end? This is, of course, a problem with woke. James Baldwin can say it, but I can't mm. because I code as white. Um, yeah, you know. we're, we're going we're gonna to definitely get, get into that. <laughs> but let me just, let me just to, for, to your question about, you know, is this a part of the left? No. So conservatives have always believed that you can have deep connections and therefore real obligations only to people who are a member of your tribe. And for people on the liberal left, it's no. Um, yeah, of course you have a certain kind of cultural connection with people who get your jokes immediately. You know, that's, um, that's normal. But you can have very deep connections and therefore serious obligations to anyone if you try. And that is a left liberal idea. And the woke has gone back to this very tribal, reactionary view that, um, you know, it's, it's my tribe against your tribe. And that is not in any way a left or a liberal notion. So I want to define these terms because, so you class yourself as on the left, but not a liberal. Is that or, or would you say that you are a liberal? I know that in America, liberal means something slightly different to what it means in the UK as well, that I often hear conservatives, you know, say that liberals are on the left. And whereas there's a lot of conserv liberal conservatives um, in, in the UK. And, and so what, when we say left, when we say liberal, when we say woke, like, what, what are we talking about? Good. Um, so I actually live in Berlin and I've lived there for long enough so that my terminology is, um, you know, uh, liberal basically means neoliberal in mm -hmm. Berlin, and also you have no problem with uh, gay marriage. So, I mean, that's about all it comes down to in, in Germany, um, which has influenced my saying I'm on the left. But I have a pretty clear definition, okay? People who are both left and liberal 
believe in universalism rather than tribalism, believe in seeking justice, and that it's not simply a matter of um, jockeying for power, and believe that progress is possible, that moral and political progress is possible. Those are three things that are common to the left and to liberals. For the left, um, there's a fourth belief, which is that social rights are human rights, that things like education and housing and access to culture and medical care are not privileges or benefits or safety nets. They're human rights, as codified in the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, whereas liberals think, you know, it would be nice if you could have them, but they're not a right. Um, so <clears throat> I add the fourth for myself, but in a time where I really fear that um, proto-fascists are connecting with each other, working together, and they're rising, I would like to push for as big a tent as possible. I'm very happy to, you know, be in, in the same tent with people who call themselves liberals and, you know, social rights, I don't know, you know, let's see if we can manage it, because um, there are a lot of people in a lot of different countries who would like to take away our political rights, and those are really on the line right now. Mm. And, and then woke, how, how would you define that? As people who are, as I started to say at the beginning, motivated by left liberal emotions, standing with the oppressed, trying to get rid of oppression, but who often, unbeknownst to themselves, have been influenced by a lot of quite reactionary views that are the opposite of that. There is no universalism. Universalism is a fraud invented by uh, Eurocentric white men who were trying to force their values on the rest of the world. You've heard that one, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, justice is also a fraud. Um, there's nothing but uh, jockeying for power. There is no concept of justice apart from power. And progress would be nice, but actually for every instance it looks like progress, we actually uh, have a more subtle form of domination. And that's also a view that I'm sure you've mm. heard as well. So I, I want us to take all of those different parts of the, this new um, ideology uh, that is gaining so much influence over public discourse. I guess I want to ask you also, how, when did you see that change in the left? And, and do you have any thoughts as to why that happened? Because that is a very big shift from it's the huge. universalistic um, enlightenment um, ideals to what you were you know, alluding to, many uh, very narrow, often quite reactionary uh, uh, approaches to many of those questions. So when did you see that change happening and, and what do you think caused that? So I didn't notice the beginning of it. I was just in other fields. I, I do think that post-colonial theory has a lot to do with it. Um, basically united by the idea that the Enlightenment is a fraud and that anything that comes out of the Enlightenment is, a, you know, a, a form of domination um, mm -hmm. of by Europeans of the rest of the world. Uh, that was being taught in American universities, but not things that I was studying. But it did seep into the water stream slowly but surely, and of course not just in America. I want to emphasize this is not just an Anglo-American problem. It's a real international problem, but um, we can talk about that in a minute. I think two dates are really important in thinking about how this developed. And one is 1991, when real existing socialism collapsed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who had spent their lives arguing or thinking about, you know, well, am I a Maoist or a Trotskyist or whatever, were in a state of shock. And um, instead of asking themselves, where did it go wrong? How did this emancipatory universalist project um, turn into a Stalinist hell, or um, you know, if not hell, at least a quite repressive set of governments? Instead of there being a, the, a real kind of international discussion of, okay, that form of socialism you know, landed in a dead end, 
but uh, just as there are many forms of capitalism, maybe there's a different way to do socialism, people were so shocked and that many people took the sort of neoliberal line, this is the end of history, you cannot unite people on values. You can unite people because we all want the same stuff. So if we give everybody a lot of consumer goods, we'll make them happy. That's the only kind of universalism that there is. And people who wanted more out of their lives and also more out of their political lives concentrated on small scale stuff. Well, let me concentrate on this form of sexism, this form of racism, this form of homophobia. And, you know, maybe there needed to be a pause. Um, but the hope for a kind of universalist leftist project never got reimagined. It looked like it might have begun uh, again with Occupy Wall Street. There was a bit of a moment where you thought people were going to come together and they didn't. And I think part of the problem is uh, then happened with the second date, and that's 2016. Mm. Now, I don't want to be too America-centric just because I <laughs> was born there. Well, we have we have a lot of American people listening, so <laughs> I, we're very familiar with some of the, the discussion around that. Well, I followed the world's reaction to the uh, election of Barack Obama, mm. and the entire world celebrated. Uh, with the idea that, as, as President Obama used to quote Martin Luther King, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And it really seemed to be doing that. And then you had eight years. I don't agree with everything he did. I wish he were more leftist rather than liberal. But um, you had eight years of this family who exuded intelligence, integrity, they were even beautiful and cool, mm -hmm. all of them, including the grandmother, you know, and in the world's, you know, most important position, okay? And I, um, I mean, I was actually had the great joy and privilege of being in Grant Park the night he was elected, and I can, Amazing. you know, remember people standing around me, you know, older black men crying that I should live to see this day. I will never forget it, okay? Now imagine you're, because I was helping to get out the vote and stuff and, uh, you know, in Indiana and, uh, and I got to be there. Probably the happiest night of my life, actually. Um, and again, this is not to say that I no. agree with every policy that Obama did or didn't put into office but it's that I was deeply aware that this was a historical yeah, moment. The significance was huge. Yeah, yeah. Now imagine that you're a 10-year-old or even a 15-year-old in 2008. I don't know how old you are, but um, I'm not asking. But um, this is the norm. You don't quite get how historically significant that is. It's the norm. I mean, that's what happens when you achieve some pro progress, is that kids grow up thinking, yeah, well, why shouldn't a cool black family be sitting in the White House for eight mm -hmm. years, okay? Um, and then you live through eight years of that, and you see, oh, I wish he'd done more of that, and I wish he'd done more of this, and we still have some problems, and but okay, this is the floor of expectations. And suddenly 2016 happens, and the you could not have dreamed up um, more of an exact opposite um, to the Obama family than the Trump family, mm. okay? And it is familiar. I mean, you know, the U.S. president is not just the person who's the president. It's a whole what his ethos is, what he who he surrounds himself with. Mm. The temperament, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think for... Um, an awful lot of people who had grown up thinking that Obama was normal. Man, the arc of history just went backwards mm -hmm. in the most radical imaginable way. And that was a huge uh, blow. And I get it that it was a huge blow. I mean, it was a blow for me. I contemplated a lot of <laughs> strange things that morning and 
um, the only thing that I did was actually become a German citizen, which I hadn't been. Mm. Um, oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, I still have my American citizenship, but I, um, I decided that day to apply for German citizenship, wow. partly um, as a political statement, but also partly be as a form of protection. Mm. Um, mm. We don't know. Mm. Mm. Um, anyway, um, the word woke played no role in the 2016 election. It's an old word, was first used by the Mississippi blues man Lead Belly mm. in the 30s. They woke, yeah. that whole idea. S sounds fine, mm. um, but it, it wasn't part of general discourse. In 2016, it's all the Republicans in the US have to run on um, now in 2024. Um, you know, France, le wokeism is a big deal. Woke is, uh, you know, discussed in lots and lots of places that I wouldn't have expected it to. So I, I think that runs out of, of 2016 or 2017. Um, yeah. I, I really, I find that very interesting, this idea that I guess the, the failure of um, maybe some of the, the grand political projects of the 20th century um, essentially unleashed a, a, pe a pessimism about the, the possibility of uh, um, you know, radical, transformative political mm -hmm. change. And, and the, the, uh, the expectations perhaps are reduced and that there was the, the motivation, the uh, desire to uh, come up with um, grand ideas and big ideas for change, you know, that, that it lost a lot of steam. Um, and then fast forward obviously to 2016, it's very interesting that um, I, I can definitely understand this idea that the, uh, the, the arc of history uh, was moving in a particular direction. And uh, obviously Trump came along and there's a lot of liberals who really were panicked, were anxious and ha perhaps were really rethinking um, their, their ideas and perhaps were more susceptible to some other ideas like woke and so on. Um, as a response, is that kind of what you're? Yeah, I, I mean that that first of all, there's an enormous sense of rage and depression, mm, mm, mm. Um, and and indeed hopelessness. Mm. This is where we were mm. headed towards, you know, and the feeling that there is no more large scale universalist project. Mm. All you can do is, if you want to do anything at all, other than get high. Mm is, uh, you know, focus on this or that case of discrimination. Okay. So and also, I mean, let's face it, um, Donald Trump is a die-hard racist, sexist, homophobe. Mm. And, um, you know, the dog whistles are not even dog whistles. Anybody can hear them. So the feeling that... Um, he came to power on a wave of reactionary racism and sexism and homophobia. It's it a real, you know, the, it's true. So, so what do you say to those people? Because, I, I, I mean, I, I want to get into other aspects of, of, of the book, but just on that Donald Trump point, um, and just as an outside observer, the polls, even though it's still obviously huge support for, for the Democrats amongst uh, minority voters in America, for example, in the last election, I understand that his support amongst Latinos, for example, really, really increased. And while and his black male support of um, Donald Trump increased quite substantially. And I think according to the polls, it is increasing amongst uh, uh, the, the so-called black vote and, and the Latino vote. So what, what, what do you say to that? Because some people, I guess, people that are strongly sympathetic to uh, some elements, I guess, of uh, Trump's version of populism. Um, might say actually uh, this is th this isn't about race that this is actually um, about all sorts of different things whether that's American industry or a sense that the you know so-called coastal elites were uh, detached from the interests of uh, middle America because it, it is interesting that his vote has actually increased among some minority voters and I think that shows that people don't vote their ethnic background mm. and it's a crazy assumption mm. I mean I can remember in 07 when um, other Americans said to me you know but you're a middle a middle-aged white woman why aren't you supporting Hillary mm. well this 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 <laughs> and this reason mm. you know um, it's it's a very bizarre assumption first of all 
Um, so let's just take, take, let's use that to think about whether our voting patterns are biologically determined. Mm. I don't think they are. Um, no, fair enough. No, I, I, I would, of course, agree um, with that. But I, I definitely think it is interesting how, um, despite um, the statements and some of the policies that Trump has uh, you know, tried to push forward, his vote amongst certain groups have increased. So, you know, what what is motivating that? And I think it might partly be some of the things that you're talking about that uh, maybe this the ideology that is coming out of um, the other side of the political spectrum uh, isn't actually is being distracted and not speaking to the real material concerns that people. I have. completely agree with you. And by the way, this is happening in Germany right now. Um, the second highest. Uh, polling numbers in Germany. We have elections, well, we have national elections in two years, but we have st a, a lot of important state elections next year, um, is our very far right party, the uh, AFD. Mm. And they're quite explicit about the idea that people are talking about gender language. It's a slightly different, because it's different language. The funny thing is that the people... Um, the woke who get extraordinarily focused on non-sexist language mm. don't think about the fact that every language does gendering differently. Mm. For example, um, in English, you'd probably think it was sexist to call somebody a prime ministeress, mm. wouldn't you? Mm. Right? <laughs> okay. In Germany, it's absolutely the opposite. If you, <laughs> if you don't call someone, uh, you know, and, and then appeal to people, citizens and citizenesses, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've, you've uh, you know... It's Deni a, have you denied the... You've denied, you know, yeah. the progress of women or something. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, and there, then, so people spend an awful lot of time arguing about this, while people, particularly in uh, East Germany, for complicated reasons, because their pensions were based on their lifetime of working, and in East Germany they got lower pensions because rent was about, their wages were lower because rent was about 10 marks a month or something, okay? Mm -hmm. So they now can't pay their rents on the pensions that they're getting, if they're retired. And so what do I care about gender language if I cannot pay my rent, mm. for example? Okay, so so that's um, that is an issue mm. that um, is causing a lot of political turmoil right now mm. in in Germany, and I believe it's doing that in uh, in the U.S. and I. You know, those are the two countries that I follow most intensely and feel like I have a right to speak about. But I was really interested that um, my book uh, is apparently already, and it's not yet in a Spanish edition, uh, causing um, some waves in Chile. Okay. Where uh, they had, um, you had the first left-wing president since Salvador Allende um, elected either a year or two years ago. I didn't follow this as closely as I will now because I'm going to Chile. I'm very happy about it. Oh, wow, amazing. And he wanted to start a, a, a constitutional referendum to change the Constitution. And apparently, a lot of woke stuff got into the draft. And 55% um, of the Chilean people rejected it. So it's an issue in, in various parts of the world that the um, the so-called left, and that's why I wanted to argue that left is not woke, the so-called left is focused really on niche questions mm -hmm. and not on, it's not only not on material values, because I don't think that we're only moved by our own interests. I actually think that a lot of people are moved by justice and wanting to live in a just and decent world. And this is one of the rather reactionary assumptions that we've gotten so used to hearing also from things like evolutionary psychology. No, 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 we're only moved by material interests or interests of power. 
And nobody is speaking to that. Nobody's either speaking to the real material needs in a world where the gap between wealth and poverty is increasing all the time, but nobody's speaking to the moral needs either, which the left used to do. So on that point, let, let's go back to some of the things that you um, talk about um, in the book, and you, you've written more widely about the Enlightenment. And as we kind of touched upon in the beginning, that is a, a very, the, the woke characterization of the enlightenment is quite a different one um, and you alluded to it this idea that you know uh, enlightenment the enlightenment project was essentially a racist one um, and that actually uh, many of the ideals progress um, agency freedom are really a cover for um, uh, white western domination so so what do you think of those arguments and, and what how what, what are your arguments to counter them essentially read the text <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, don't, you don't have to read a complicated text. Um, pick up Voltaire's Candide, which is a little funny novel, and you will see as, you know, strong a denunciation of slavery, colonialism, um, feudal hierarchies. I mean, when I first heard those arguments, um, because I didn't, study post-colonial theory until, I didn't even really encounter it until um, around 2005 or six, um, not seriously. And I first heard these arguments and I thought, this is silly. I didn't even, because um, the idea of Eurocentrism comes from the Enlightenment, okay? It was Enlightenment thinkers who said, hey, we have a lot to learn from other parts of the world. They do a lot of things better. And, you know, the, the whole country, they often wrote in the voices of Chinese people, indigenous South Americans, Tahitians. Um, you know, you have, it was a trope that was probably influenced as some new research uh, suggests by actual encounters with, say, indigenous uh, Native Americans, mm -hmm. okay? But they said things in the voices of Persians, of the, the first Persian letters by Montesquieu, criticizing European culture that they couldn't have said in their own voices because they were in danger, and the danger was more than a Twitter shit storm. Mm. My favorite example of this, there's a um, philosopher named Christian Wolf, who um, basically nobody remembers now, but he was um, a major philosopher uh, in Germany in uh, the early, seven, uh, early 18th century. He read some Confucius, he read some Mencius, and he made a pub some public lectures saying, you know what, they're not Christians, but they're perfectly moral people. Mm -hmm. For that, he was ordered to leave not just his professorship, but the entire state of Prussia within 48 hours, or he would have been executed, okay? So these were people who were really on the line for saying, hey, look at the, Europe look at the non-Europeans. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it baffles me that nobody bothers to look at the history or the texts. But, but hasn't there alway, always been some tension? Because I think um, that there is this idea that um, the during the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, there was this desire to uh, categorize, um, to uh, make sense. And, and that was simultaneous uh, with the development of, of racial categories and racial taxonomies as a way of um, making sense of, of, of slavery and making sense of inequality. Um, that the, the races, the concept of inherent, distinct, superior races emerge. So are, 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 you, are you suggesting that, that, that there is no truth to the idea that, um, that, there were, uh, that within the Enlightenment project there were those tensions and contradictions and there were some who, who um, did attempt to uh, delineate some groups as superior and inferior? So let's start at the bottom. They were almost all, with the exception of uh, Condorcet, as far as I'm sure, they were sexist. Mm -hmm. They really didn't think women uh, had equal rights. And I've had to live with that. And one way that I find of living with it is thinking about what life was like for women um, where there was no reliable birth control, there was no safe 
um, childbearing and a huge number of children died before they were five, well, like half of all children died before they were five years old. So in order to reproduce the human race, women really had to bear at least five children that lived. And that meant so much of their lives were, unless they were nuns, um, taken up with childbearing that it really was hard to imagine that men and women could live equal lives. That's an explanation. It's not an excuse, but it's a pretty decent explanation. Um, so a lot of sexist remarks that you can find and some racist ones. No question about it. That is, not everybody is able to rid themselves of the prejudices that they grow up in the middle ev uh, in the middle of, even while they're intellectually fighting against those principles. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I think goes wrong with the post-colonial argument is that they confuse the Enlightenment thinkers with the conditions they were opposing. And they forget the fact that, you know, like uh, liberal left intellectuals everywhere, they don't always win their battles, okay? Um, so they were absolutely against colonialism. No question about it, thunderingly. I, I once thought as a, um, you know, it would just be a fun intellectual project to put some statements of Diderot next to statements of Franz Fanon mm. and make the reader guess who was um, saying what. But the problem is Diderot talks about poison arrows and Fanon talks about, you know, guns. So, but, but Diderot is, is speaking to native South Africans you know, fly, let your poison arrows fly against the Dutch invaders. Don't let one of them alive uh, to tell the tale, okay? Um, so they were absolutely, and Kant uh, congratulates the, the uh, Chinese and the Japanese for closing their doors to colonialists and traders, okay? So um, it's all there. Um, they didn't win those battles. Right? I mean, this, this is 18th century, and of course, as we saw, colonialism just um, you know, got worse and bigger as the 19th century wore on and then into the early 20th. And at that point, um, Europeans who had been convinced by the arguments of the Enlightenment, self-determination is a good thing and the rule of law and people shouldn't dominate other people just because they're bigger and have better weapons or something. Um, they wanted all those rights for themselves. And so they used the, um, you know, these racist theories to say, well, but it's okay for those people. But the interesting thing is, of course, colonialism did not begin with the Enlightenment. We got it back to the Greeks and the Romans, we got it with the Aztecs, we've got it in Mali, we've got it, uh, you know, the Khmer, the Chinese. It was taken for granted that bigger nations, bigger tribes, before there was even a serious concept of nation in our sense, bigger tribes got to swallow up littler tribes in one or, you know, varying degrees of cruelty, all right? Um, but the idea that this was a problem comes from the Enlightenment. They just weren't able to get it through, and people instrumentalized their arguments. But they're the ground that we have to stand on in every anti-colonial struggle. Mm. You know, oh, there's so much that um, I want to get into. I don't know, have all, enough time to get into all of it. I mean, I guess um, a way of perhaps looping it uh, to a concluding point, but being able to touch upon many of the things is, I guess, how, how, do, how do we then reclaim these ideals or reclaim the left? Because... In a lot of ways, I think, as you alluded to with woke, is that it often plays on kernels of truth, right? So let's say, I think in your book, you talk about standpoint epistemology and this um, idea that um, you, know, you have a distinct and unique standpoint um, if you are a woman or if you're black or, or so on and so forth. But there is 
whilst I don't agree with standpoint epistemology, there is a grain of truth in the idea that obviously living in the world as a uh, black woman or as a you know Jewish man or as some or whatever identity there might be does give you a a, a particular perspective um, that other people may not be able to experience. That doesn't mean that we can't imagine what it might <clears throat> feel like to be um, someone moving in the world in a different body. But and there's limitations to how much you can use that perspective to say that you know this is what it means to be a black person. Um, so uh, essentially, my my question is that um, how do we uh, respond to those grains of truth? that have been taken in a way that I think is to actually divide people and, and prevent us from building solidarity across different lines? So we do several things. One is to do away with the concept of cultural appropriation because the way we learn to understand other people's standpoints apart from personal conversation is stepping into pieces of their culture. And of course we can't do that for everyone, but I highly recommend that everybody try to do it for at least two other cultures that they didn't grow up with. If you only do it for one, then you're always being binary. You're saying, well, I do it this way and they do it. But if you, then you, you realize, um, first of all, a lot about your own perspective and what assumptions you take for granted that not everyone does. But then you, you know, you get an appreciation of the variety of different cultures. And you know that's one of my great heroes is um, the great um, black artist and activist Paul Robeson, who I've written on and who I've called a hero of cultural appropriation because he actually, what one of the things that he did was to put together kind of a canon of left-wing songs from different cultures and to say, well, you know, this is something that we can all understand and and you know appreciate. So that's one thing is just just scrap the notion of cultural appropriation because there's nothing that gives us the perspective of other people um, like really good art, mm -hmm. okay, in all of its forms. But the other thing is really to question what a standpoint is. Um, and I would be really put, if somebody said, well, tell us what the world likes, looks like from your standpoint. I would say, well, which standpoint? Um, I actually think being an expat American is a very specific standpoint. And being an expat anything that is living for a very long time in another part of the world in another land. So, you know, is that my standpoint? Is my standpoint being a Jewish woman? I mean, actually, one of the motivations for writing this book has been my involvement in the last three years in Germany of trying to get a universalist Jewish perspective uh, taken seriously. Um, actually, the universalist tradition in Judaism is the comes from the Bible, for one thing, but the great... German Jews, who the Germans now feel uh, terrible about, Moses Mendelssohn, Karl Marx, Albert Einstein, Hannah Arendt, they were all universalists. They were not just focused on Jewish suffering. Um, they were focused on you know, universal justice, every single one of them. And at the moment in Germany, there's thought to be a, um, some kind of a conflict between fighting anti-Semitism and fighting other forms of racism, including racism towards Palestinians in the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. So I've been called not a real Jew. <laughs> this is really funny, but I've been called not a real Jew because I have the odd belief that Palestinians have human rights and that they're being deeply violated and that one needs to do something about it. It's not anti-Semitic to say, uh, you know, this, uh, this is a proto-fascist government and it needs to be opposed. Um, so I mean, so what's, what is my standpoint? Is my standpoint, I suppose I grew up with this universalist Jewish standpoint as a child in the American South in the days of the civil rights movement, you know? Um, 
we were slaves in Egypt and therefore we stand with the people who were slaves in the land of Georgia and our synagogue was bombed and stuff. So that's something I grew up with, but it's a view I could have chosen to reject as an adult and to say, eh, I don't think so, maybe I'm just interested in my tribe. Um, you know, but am I, am I determined by the fact that today I am sad to say, though less in the United States, there are more Jewish nationalists than Jewish universalists. Mm -hmm. Am I determined by the ethnic group that I was born into to a particular political and moral view, or um, do I get to choose my standpoint on those questions? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think those are examples that people need to think about before they talk about standpoints. Mm -hmm. they're Standpoints are complicated things, and they're not biologically determined. Mm. And just finally, you know, today, the there are all these debates going on in America and you know in the UK as well, but just in America in terms of so-called critical race theory in schools, and and it, it has become a very fractured, very polarized, very politically heated discussion. How? What, what do you think about where the discussion is now and um, and how it can get to a point where um, these ideals are actually reclaimed again and that is that that is the dominant mainstream discussion amongst liberals and, and, and people on the left um, in, in the context of um, the way that it's become so fractured at the moment? It's a great question and they're friends of mine who, uh, who, when I was writing the book, said, do not use the word woke in the title. The right will instrumentalize you. And I thought about alternatives quite a lot. And I decided um, we know the phenomena. Even if nobody can define it, everybody can think of 10 examples of woke behavior that they you know, read about or experienced themselves in the last four months. Um, so I thought, well, what am I going to do not to be instrumentalized? Um, first of all, I'm going to say on the first page of the book that I consider myself a socialist, which is in the U.S. <laughs> debate. Uh, the U.S. debate the is really, yeah. <laughs> and secondly, I'm not going to go on talk shows that are clearly engaged in some form of woke bashing, mm -hmm. even if they're not Trump or DeSantis. I'm just, I'm not going to do that. And so, so far, the only, you know, sort of half instrumentalizing was a, a podcast that said, well, she has a few good ideas, but you have to go through a lot of left-wing bullshit to get there. So I don't think I'm helping the right, although I've been accused in, in certain um, reviews uh, of doing so. Um, I think the problem is to get out of this binary that U.S. politics is really deeply stuck in. And if I wrote this book with a goal, well, I did write this book with a goal, it's that I know so many people on the liberal left who say, I don't have a political home anymore. I feel alienated from the woke left. Um, I'm certainly not going to vote for Trump or DeSantis, but I can't get politically engaged because I'll go to a meeting and someone will accuse me of, here's an interesting story. A friend of mine quit her job as a manager, a direct managing director of a major hospital when um, she saw a colleague come in on crutches and say, oh, what happened? And the colleague said, don't be so ableist. Oh. <laughs> Well, that, that, where do you go from there? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, so that people are, I, I know people who are retiring, who are certainly not politically active um, because they feel that, uh, you know, the left has been taken over by a set of really very tangential and symbolic questions rather than focusing on the real dangers that are in front of us. And I'm hoping that people will simply have the guts to stand up and say this. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times people have said to me, you know, I was thinking that, but I was afraid to say it. Yeah, I've had that. 
I bet you have. Mm. I bet you have. Mm. So uh, I, I think if more of us simply did that and realized we weren't going to get flayed, mm. or or we can get a, you know, so a Twitter storm doesn't kill you. It really doesn't. Mm. You have people calling you names, and you know, fortunately, I mean, there are people, of course, who are fired. But if one has a, you know, a modicum of sort of existential security then it's just a, a little bit of nerve is really all that's needed. And people will find that all kinds of people will nod and say, thank you. I was going to say it, but I was afraid. Mm. Uh, just one, do, do, you f do you have confidence in, in the, the future of the left and where it's going? Confidence is an interesting word. Um, confidence is sort of close to hope. I always say I'm not an optimist because mm. optimism is a claim about the way the world is. And um, I don't know where the world is going. But I, I feel bound to have hope because ho hope is necessary if you're going to change anything in the world. And this is an argument that actually comes from Immanuel Kant, but Noam Chomsky said it to me once. And I said, do you know this comes from Kant? He said, no, but it's true. So whether you, you know, take your views from Kant or from Chomsky or whoever, um, if you don't have hope, uh, then we really are lost because we're, we're facing twin crises in the world. And when I say we, I really mean uh, the whole world. Um, we're facing a rise of fascism uh, people who are well organized, in touch with each other, sharing strategies uh, from you know India to Russia to uh, Israel to Turkey to um, France uh, to the U.S. So we're facing that, and we're facing a climate crisis. And the only way to uh, stare down those two crises is to go back to Enlightenment universalism. Thank you, Susan Nyman, for joining me on the podcast. A real pleasure. I love the work that you're doing.